Ladies and gentlemen, my name is um, Liam McKechnie, as Adam has told you. I um, come from Ireland and I sit as a judge in Dublin. Um, for my sins, I've been a judge now, I think, 15 years. The first 10 years in our major trial court called the High Court. And for the past five years in our Supreme Court. Um, again, as Adam has said, um, Ireland is obviously a small country, but it's a small common law country, uh, essentially, though heavily influenced now by many regulations and other form of leg legislative measures that emanate from Brussels and the surrounds. Um, my introduction to uh, competition law, believe it or not, came a bit late in the day as it did to European law in general. When I was going to college, European law was not on the agenda at all. Um, in fact, I was a barrister practicing in Dublin, and a lot of barristers stood fastly against getting any getting involved to any way, to any extent, in um, European law of any dimension. That was in 1969, 70, 71. In any event, I went. I travelled through practice and. Um, doing a lot of commercial stuff and so forth. And I eventually decided, I became a judge in 2000, I eventually decided in 2003 that my um, deficit with regard to European law, and in particular competition law, was such that I could not let it continue. So I decided to go back uh, to University College Dublin and do a master's degree in European law, concentrating on competition law. That created a bit of a difficulty for a full-time judge who didn't want the president of his court or anyone else for that matter to know what I was doing. So I enlisted the aid of my daughter who had didn't qualify as a barrister but who had not decided she was going to practice law. We both did the fully full-time one-year course together, taking exactly the same subjects, substituting for each other and when one could not get to a lecture and thereafter crossing notes. So in that way, um, I had to sit an exam at the end of it, which is the most frightening prospect for any individual who had not done so or who had not engaged in that process for about 30 years previously. Be that as it may, I did, and then I became the competition law judge for the High Court in 2004, a position I held until I went to the Supreme Court in 2010. All claims, both civil and criminal, went through our major trial court the High Court, and thus all claims came through me. And um, interestingly enough, we might have had maybe two or three claims a year. Uh, in the latter half of the period I mentioned, we had one or two follow-on actions, and some of the uh, standalone actions did go to judgment and did go to appeal, but very few of them. Some of the follow-on actions, likewise, but significantly, most of them settled. And thus, the experience which I got over that six or seven year period, whilst invaluable, nonetheless, it is likely to fade into insignificance if you compare the kind of experience that Adam would have in any given 12 month period in the tribunal in London. And be it as it may, we have a serious interest in competition law. We are kind of an active, without being over active, uh, litigious. Um, country and we have lots of judicial people who held posts either in the European Court of Justice or the Court of First Instance. John Cook who's a colleague um, of ours uh, also on the association in fact was there for 12 or 13 years and the former Chief Justice was there and several others including um, an advocate general. So there's a kind of a broad background of an introduction uh, for me coming to competition law. Um, the Supreme Court is our final appellate court and we, we deal with everything. Um, any point of law that can be phrased by uh, a qualified lawyer can find its way to us from a decision in the High Court. Because of the, the uh, variety of cases that come up to us, interestingly enough, very few competition cases have emerged for appellate court jurisdiction in the past five years. Thus one has concentrated quite heavily on conferences, on seminars, um, on both participating and um, of filling the roles that you have today. So I'm, I'm fairly familiar with the period uh, that led up to the adoption of this directive and what um, 
went behind it. In the presentation that I'm about to give, I have given some of the background in part A um, of the slides. It's not necessary to go into it in any great depth. I will refer to one or two, just to add a bit of a slight bit more flavour to what Adam gave you of the background. But it's a rather intriguing process which uh, had to be gone through before the directive was in fact published in 2014. If you uh, look at that slide, its heading is why did it happen. Accurately it should be why uh, did it have to happen, but it had to happen on the civil side. Um, from early stages, um, the authorities in question realised that public enforcement just simply wasn't sufficient in itself in order to enhance um, the proper functioning of the internal market and to avoid any uh, um, unnecessary distortion in that. It was thus essential that that public enforcement would be supported in a private way. Uh, that process, of course, um, had within it the intrinsic value that individuals who suffered harm or who suffered loss, as we would call it, could in fact institute proceedings themselves and could get compensation. Neither the Competition Authority or the Commission is empowered um, to compensate any individual or groups of individuals uh, who may have suffered harm because of some infringement of 101 or 102. In addition, of course, if carteliers and dominant players realised that in their own national territories people could invoke private actions, then that might have some sort of deterrent effect on them. Um, the, that process of thinking um, certainly uh, enhanced itself uh, in an accelerated way with the passing of Regulation 01-2003. Prior to then, of course, we had the Commission probably being the sole investigator at European level um, with regard to such infringements. And while success undoubtedly followed in what could be described as several nuclear cases, nonetheless, because of limited resources and because of of the ability and finance of carteliers, it became increasingly more difficult, really, to have any worthwhile and effective um, overall enforcement of the competition rules, thereby um, interfering with the internal market, with its proper and efficient functioning, and of course, in the process of starting competition. I, I, I'm not going to go through uh, many of these, but I do want to highlight a, a couple of points as to the background which gave rise to the necessity um, for passing this directive. There were many obstacles in the way of private individuals who might institute proceedings um, in, in Ireland and I suspect in, in, in many of your countries. There is one little oddity about Ireland which is this. I'm sure there might be many but the one I speak about is on the competition side. Um, our National Competition Authority does not have a role that mirror images and the European Commission uh, um, at the uh, order level. That's because under our constitution only, only judges duly appointed can administer uh, justice in courts established by law. So whilst the National Competition Authority can investigate complaints um, and can issue recommendations, it cannot in fact come to any definitive finding either on an infringement, it cannot impose any fine or other sanction, it, it cannot impose any remedial uh, requirements such as uh, desisting from certain practices or for example offloading certain subsidiaries, it cannot do any of those, it must go to the court to do so. So in that respect um, we are, uh, Ireland and I think there is one, Denmark, I'm not quite sure, there is one other nation um, there's one other member of the EU which has a similar uh, situation to us. Consequently, our domestic competition law also designates the courts at every level as being a national competition authority. This in theory should create a problem because there are certain obligations imposed on national competition authorities in its reporting structure uh, to the European Commission. Um, and in theory, since we are also a national competition authority, one would expect that we would have to follow the same reporting uh, regime. One would expect we might have to follow the same process of getting um, permission, etc. In truth, 
we don't and in truth the commission recognizes that there would be a problem with regards to judicial independence if that was taken too far so we we in effect operate in the same way as if we were not designated as a national competition and um, the difficulties and um, before this directive and indeed will continue thereafter uh, for some time at least which arose from trying to take a civil action were multiple one and very obvious was the nature of the infringer and the nature of the infringement by their very nature carteliers tend to be secretive they tend to conceal a great deal and um, even from the sophisticated eye even from those who go in scientifically and drill into the information available to see what the result might be they are also of course promoted by by on occasions by lots of money sophisticated access to, to top class lawyers etc so it became terribly difficult and um, to break and um, that barrier down secondly even though the common law countries never suffered from the same inhibitions as a lot of civil law countries did with regard to ac access to documents that even in a fairly liberal regime as we had in Ireland and um, was also quite difficult on behalf of the claimant in Ireland and um, the, the courts if there was a claim of, of privilege if there was a claim of confidentiality raised with regards to any document and if it was contested the courts took it upon themselves to look and examine the documents they would then balance uh, the requirement of the public interest in maintaining that confidentiality or privilege the public interest against the competing public interest in the administration of justice which inevitably means that of course the more documentation that's available to a judge the more likely is that the resulting decision will be better than if such documentation was not that and um, has been in existence since 1972 we in that year by way of judicial decision abolished any privilege that would attach to the executive by reason of the executives claiming such privilege per se prior to then as was the situation in the UK if the minister swore an affidavit to the effect that this was a document um, within the executive in respect of which he wanted privilege then ministerial privilege would attach to it per se uh, we did not follow that practice in 1972 and ever since uh, we have this balancing exercise that I have mentioned consequently and um, this new regime with regards to access to documents fits in very comfortably with us we, we, we really have no difficulty at the level of principle and um, either by judicial control or practitioners in their assessment of it in in coming to a decision on documents even so um, and even given that liberal regime um, you had to prove um, at least that there was a plausibility of such documents existing and of course because of its nature it was very difficult to do so. Thirdly there was no question of any collective redress system I think uh, throughout Europe and um, thereby making it very difficult for small consumers who may in fact have suffered loss making it very difficult for them individually uh, to be in a position to mount an action fourthly there were no rules really on the passing off defense and of real significance I think uh, to judges and to intended claimants was the difficulty in quantifying harm how do you go about it and um, so all of these difficulties were in play they were supported by a belief that the interaction between public and private was the best way to thoroughly enforce uh, the competition rules and hence steps uh, were commenced to be taken at different levels which in fact uh, were the forerunners to this directive if I just take it out to slide 8 and I won't read it for you but this is the influence of the ECJ um, on uh, what ultimately transpired in 2014 uh, in fact Adam mentioned a, a decade and of course he's right because if you look at the second um, heading there the Commission's commitment and um, with the Ashhurst report in 2004 that is a decade but if you go back in fact to BRT in Sabham in 1974 that really was the, the kick the first real decision whereby the seeds for Courage and Crehan 
were eventually laid. And so you have influence of the ECJ, you have influence of the Commission, you have reforms at various national levels, all, all being supported by what's undoubtedly uh, the most major significant, the most major decision in this area at that time, Courage and Cran. Um, you're familiar with it, so I, I won't um, even attempt to summarise it for you. This is really a graphic presentation of the various inputs that I've mentioned. And of course, after Courage and Crane, we had the Green Paper, White Paper. Then we had more activity by the ECJ, Manfrede, we had Frider, Otis, Donna, and Cole. Um, and hence the directive. I was about to say, hence the long awaited directive, but that would be unfair, unquestionably. Uh, the Commission and the various Director Generals and Commissioners for several years were quite keen to put some concrete proposal on the table uh, which would at least throughout the European Union approximate um, how various national authorities and national judges approach this problem and it is a difficult and trying area they put a great deal of work into it and um, it is to their credit in fact uh, that this directive was published in 2014 these are the main ingredients of it. Uh, these are some of the main changes. Easier access to evidence, benefit of final infringement decision by NCA, limitation periods I will come back to in a moment because there can be some striking oddities and um, perhaps emerging from their full payout, passing on defence, critically important to know, um, not only in substance what it is, but how in fact it can operate in practice. Thus, the infusion of presumptions which have helped a great deal along the line. Full compensation, just before I leave that, cartels joint and several liability, um, which is a concept I'm not sure if you're really familiar with in domestic law or not. Uh, we had a conference in London sometime last year on this and many people were unclear as to, in fact, uh, how, how this would work in practice that if you had a claimant suing three or four defendants and if the claimant decided to settle with one defendant or one defendant decided to settle with the claimant what would be the position vis-a-vis -vis the claimant and the remaining defendants or the settling defendant and the remaining defendants and there have been rules certainly uh, statutory rules in England since 1954 on that because um, Ireland cogged them in 1961 into the Civil Liability Act and again it's a concept that in principle we're fairly familiar with. That's just um, um, a very broad brush look at what the background is.